All right, so we're getting started on visualization today. A um, few announcements. Um, homework two um, is due tomorrow night. Um, if you didn't get the memo, we gave you a two day extension uh, because of everything going on this week. Uh, homework three will still be due at the usual time next Thursday. So um, if you've already finished homework two, great. We'll be releasing homework three tonight and you can get started on it starting tonight. Um, we've finally um, uh, finalized the date and time for the midterm based on all of your responses to the uh, survey that we gave you in homework one. Um, so here's the plan. Um, we're going to have the midterm on October 16th, 7 to 9 p.m. That's 7 to 9 p.m. California time. Uh, so you can translate into wherever you are, your own time zone. If that time works out to be some crazy time in your time zone, um, we're not expecting you to take the exam at 3 a.m. In, in your local time zone. Uh, we will make a post on Piazza where you can fill out a conflict form if, you, um, if that ends up being at a, a ridiculous time in your uh, local time zone. Um, uh, but that will be the time we're expecting. Apart from that, that'll be the time we're expecting everyone to take. So we're not having a 24 hour window. You take the exam during that uh, two hour time zone. Um, we expect you'll take the exam online. Um, uh, you'll be filling out multiple choice questions. We'll have you short answer questions, fill in the blank. Um, so you'll, you'll be timed exam um, and um, covering uh, the kinds of material that you, you, you're seeing on uh, practice worksheets, on labs, on homeworks, 7 to 9 p.m. p.m. at night in the evening California time. It's a two-hour exam. Um, I, we haven't decided about whether it'll be open notes. Uh, the platform um, haven't worked out that. We're still doing some testing and working that out. Um, uh, could, be, could be grade scope, could be a, a special exam tool. I don't think it'll be a notebook. Will, be, will there be coding? Yeah, coding will be one of the topics that we'll test. Uh, everything that we cover in the class will be in scope. So I would imagine that one of the things, one of the kinds of questions that will be on there will be testing your, your knowledge of this uh, Python programming stuff we've been teaching you. Uh, we'll provide you practice exams and past exams. Um, probably won't be on a Jupyter notebook. Um, not intended to be something, I think, where the time pressure, where there's a lot of time pressure. We should have more details as we get closer to the exam. Um, mainly at this point, I wanted you to block it off in your calendars. Uh, yes, the format will be similar to previous years and we'll give you, we'll give you practice exams you can use to practice with and see what it looks like and get some comfort. Um, there, I expect there will be a waitlist lab and a waitlist section this weekend and we'll post on Piazza. Um, I guess we'll get that post out today with a, a time and a Zoom link. Homework two is due tomorrow, which is the 12th. Yes, thank you. Let's fix that. All right, um, let's get started. Uh, I see some other questions and I'll, um, we can post them on Piazza if I haven't answered. And um, if you have accommodations through the DSP office, we'll be contacting you. We'll provide, we'll provide uh, accommodations and will there be class on the day of the final exam? No, um, but on the day of the midterm uh, TBD, we might have a review session that day. Okay, so uh, goals. Um, Goals for today, we're gonna to be looking at some visualizations um, and uh, working a little more with data, with the data and tables. So um, let me just give you a brief review, reminder of the operations we've seen with tables. Um, we have a sort operation, which lets you sort the rows of the table, pick any one column and sort it by the number in that column. Um, the take operation lets you pick some of the rows. Uh, the where operation, um, let's you pick some of the rows um, based on the values in a column. Um, you can either uh, pick all the rows where the value in a column matches some specific thing you've provided or where it meets some condition you provided. 
So we've been working with census data. It's kind of a nice data set. We'll see a lot of data sets in this class. And just as a reminder about the census data set, um, uh, this is a count of how many people are in the US and it's broken down in a number of different ways. And the data set we're looking at uh, breaks it down in a fairly simplistic way by, uh, by sex, um, uh, by year. Um, so the table we've got has uh, several columns. There's a, a population estimate 2010 column, which shows what the population was in 2010. Um, yeah, this is 2020. It's a census year. So uh, you may get a form in the mail to, to fill out so you can participate in the census this year. Um, the sex column indicates um, uh, it'll show data about uh, the number of people of a certain age. It'll show people about the number of males of a certain age, the number of females of a certain age. And so each row represents a category of people and the number of people in that category. So the sex column tells you whether um, it's about males, in which case that's a one, or females uh, represented as a two. Also, it has for convenience, some rows are sums of the others. So um, if you find a zero in the sex column, that's reporting uh, the total number of people of that age without regard to uh, their sex. And if you see a 999 in the age column, that's the total number of people without regard to their age. Okay. All right, so um, let's take a look, uh, do some more uh, work with the census data, census data set. Does table.sort also create a new table? Well, let's take a look. Let's, let's, let's just see. We're going to find that out by experimentation. So here we've got um, our, our data set read in from a spreadsheet. And uh, here's the table. And you saw this in the last lecture. It's just the same, same table we are working with before. Lots of columns in there. And we're going to work with only four of them. So I'm going to select those four. Uh, that creates a new table. And I give that table a name. I'm going to call it partial because it represents only some of the rows. I mean, some of the columns. And then. Um, Notice these uh, labels are kind of long. That was assigned by the US Census Bureau. And for convenience, I want to have a somewhat shorter um, column name. So I'm going to uh, create a new table with a different, the only difference is that we've just changed the label for these columns. See here, this index two represents column number two. And columns count from zero, one, two. So index two is actually the third column kind of a quirk and oddity of um, programming with Python and other computer languages. So uh, this uh, uh, data set, we can sort all that data based on age, based on the number in the age column. And it looks something like this. So you asked, I saw one of you ask, um, is this uh, modify the original data? Oh, thank you for the reminder to zoom in. Good call. Yes. Okay. So does the sort operation create a new table? Well, let's take a look. Let's take a look at the original table and see if it's changed or if it is uh, still the same. You can see the original table is still the same as what it was before. Here we have uh, zero, sex zero first. Um, and then after we sort it by age, you can see here all the infants, regardless of sex, this is the infants who are male and this is the infants who are female. Okay. So the sort operation did not change the original table. It creates a new table, it creates a new table. And then um, the notebook will display for you um, the result of this computation, which is a new table. Why does age start with zero? Those are the infants. Zero represents anyone from zero uh, up to less than one year old. Um, what's the difference between relabeled and dot partial relabeled? Uh, not quite sure what you're asking there. Why is it showing more than age? Well, this sort operation reorders the rows in the table. It's the same data all the same columns, it just puts the rows in a different order. 
uh, could I sort it by a descending amount of people in that age bracket? Sure, let's see how to do that. All right. Um, sending number of people. Well, maybe we'll take the 2010 column. Try this. Oh, that sorts by increasing number of people in 20, uh, by the increasing based on 2010 population. So what I wanted was the other order. So now we got something like this. There, you've got it sorted by population in 2010, decreasing population. But oh wait, there's something wrong. It has this 999 stuff. Oh, I don't want that 999. So I could get rid of the 999. Um, age is below 999. Let's try that. Syntax error. Oh, you might get syntax errors. It's good to know how to read these. So it gave me syntax error. That means there's something wrong with uh, the way that I type things in. It doesn't have the right names or something. And if you take a look, you can see here, well, if you stare at it in this particular case, um, this parenthesis, and then it doesn't have a match. I missed the parenthesis. So let's fix that. And now you see this table. And if you were to look a little more, you would realize there's mixed in here some rows for just males or just females, which is not what we wanted. So you would probably also want to add something to pick out only the rows where the sex column has zero, meaning that we're getting uh, a total population of that age. And you get a table like this. And you can see the age group that has the highest population in 2010 is 50 year olds. That's higher than anything else. Okay. Great, so that would tell you something about the demographics. Um, can two tables be displayed side to side? Um, not quite uh, the way you'd want, uh, unfortunately, uh, but what you can do is you can do an operation called join, which will combine data from two tables into a single table, and then you could display that single table. Okay. Are lectures available online? Yes, if you go to our course webpage, um, then you'll find a link to videos of all the lectures. You can also find a link where you see demos. That's this notebook right here. What's 1999 stuff represent again? That is a convenience thing the Census Bureau included, which is um, uh, lists all people of all ages. It counts the people of all ages without regard to age. Okay. All right, I'm just catching up with all of you on chat. Seems like nothing changes the table. That's about right. Yeah, the operations we provide you um, for the most part don't change the table. What they do is they create a new table. And then what I, we need to save that new table, so we assign it to a name. Often we assign it to a new name to keep track of that it's a different table. Sometimes we might reassign it to the original name. That could be a little confusing, but it just reduces the number of names floating around. So that's kind of a stylistic matter. So yeah, you asked about that. That's absolutely correct. Could I do an example of join? Uh, not today. <laughs> if you edit the demos, you get a private copy of this demos netbook, notebook. You can edit to your heart's content. It won't modify what anyone else is seeing. You, it, you can, you can, uh, it w won't cause any harm. So you're welcome to, to play with this as much as you want, make as many modifications as possible. Order of operations in the table doesn't matter. Um, well, the order of the rows doesn't matter maybe for most purposes, except it matters to us. Uh, but um, uh, the order of the operations we do here could potentially matter. It depends on what operations we're doing. How do I reassign? I mean, that's an assignment statement. Is dot where sex zero? Yes, this is the same as, this is a, just a little bit of a convenient shorthand for writing r dot equal to zero. Same thing. Good. Okay, so let's look at how to plot this data because it's kind of a pain to see this data in tabular form. All right, so we already said we want to remove um, all of these 999 rows. So let's um, give that a name. Um, let's remove the rows where um, 
that have that are broken down by just males or just females. I want to keep the ages of everyone. I showed you how to do that. And then once we do that, it's going to have a sex column in there that is the same for every row and is not really useful. So let's get rid of that useless column. And then let's look at what these tables we just created is. I created a table with one row per age category. And so here this 2010 column tells me there are 3.9 million infants or there were in 2010. Now this table is a little hard to read. So we saw last time how to plot it. So I highly recommend plotting your data. When you get a new data set, one of the first things you do is plot the data to visualize what is in there. And here we've got a plot that shows on the x-axis the age category and on the y-axis the population in 2010. Okay, so for instance, there were a little bit under 4 million infants in 2010. In other words, folks who were less than one year old. And how many 80-year-olds were there in 2010? A little over 1 million of them. So that's what you can read from this plot. And this plot makes it easier to see some trends. See what age groups there's more of, where there's dips, where there's, where there's a big bulge here. For instance, one thing you might notice is um, 20, uh, why is there a bulge somewhere around the 50s? Well, World War II ended in 1945. And so you can see here the 65, anyone who was born slightly after the, uh, the war is uh, around 65. And what are the bulge around of, of folks who are around 55 represent, maybe those are the folks around 50, um, that represent folks who were built in around 1960. So there was a big population boom somewhere around 1960 or so. Okay, so anytime you have a table, and you want to plot the relationship between two variables. One way is to use a line plot and the method for that, the operation is called plot. Now, if you look at this plot, any person who does visualization or graphic design says, well, one problem here is we should be labeling what this plot is showing. What is this y-axis showing? And so there's a couple ways to do that in the notebooks. One way is add a comment. So you can write comments in your code. It's called a comment. If you put this pound sign here, everything after that is ignored by Python. It's not executed. It's not interpreted as code. It's what's called a comment. That's something we stick in there for other people, other humans who are reading the code. It's ignored by the computer, but it's to remind us or any other reader of what, what this code is doing. So we could put in a comment that says, this plot is about the US population. An another way we could do this if you're writing a notebook for yourself or that you want to share with everyone is you could put a print statement. So you could plot and then you could put a print statement that will associate this label US population up there. But it looked kind of ugly, but it's there. Another way you could do it um, is you don't need to know this for data eight, but um, the plotting stuff that we use um, allows you to associate um, oops, okay, that was there for a reason, um, allows you to uh, put a title on the plot. And so now the plot looks like this and there's a title in there that indicates what we're plotting. So that's a, that's a good practice whenever you're plotting stuff. And yet one more way you could have done this um, if you're writing uh, a notebook um, and you wanna show someone else this plot and you wanna indicate to them what it is, uh, you can include a cell that is what's called a uh, markdown, that's text. So you take cell type and you treat it as markdown. And now that will be formatted. And then I display the plot. Okay. So for instance, I and my group, we use these notebooks in our own research as a kind of a lab notebook. When we're doing experiments, we do the experiments in a notebook. 
And then we write some text that indicates what the experiment we're doing. And then we plot some, we analyze some data and then we make some plots of the results of that analysis or some tables showing the results of our analysis. And then we have some text that says, here was the analysis I did and here's what the meaning of all this is. And then, you know, we can share that with each other. We can go back to it a week from now. If I want to remember what was the results of that analysis, I go look in the notebook and oh yeah, that's, that's what's going on. All right. So, um, let's see, what else did I want to show? Um, also, we can plot this, as I showed you last time, for two different years, showing two plots on the same plot here. And what this will do is it'll put age on the x-axis, and then every other column, it'll draw a line graph, one, one line graph per other column. In this case, we had two other columns. And each other column gets aligned with another color. And so that lets you compare multiple other columns. Okay, let me check questions in the chat, and then I'm about to move on. uh what is everyone everyone is the name of the table so we constructed a table where did we construct the table up here it's this table here we constructed by getting rid of some of the rows that, that we didn't want do you need to import anything before plotting yep and we do that for you see this cell up here at the top has imports everything you need to know everything you need to do the plotting in particular, this stuff here uh, is associated with a plotting. So that sets up your environment. Weird to think there were all items included in this table. Yeah, you're just a number. <laughs> or if you watch the British show, you know, I'm not a number. <laughs> I'm a free man. Is it possible to rename the axis of the table? Yes, if I wanted to rename the axis of the table, the way I would do that is I would relabel the labels on the columns of the table. And then when I plotted it, that would change what shows up on this plot. Um, how do you change the scale of the axis? I'm not sure. I think there's a way to do it, but I don't know it off the top of my head. So ask on Piazza and we, we can, we'll look it up. You know, We got some people in there, we know how to look up stuff in the documentation and we'll figure it out for you. Uh, what is Markdown? Markdown is a way of writing text. Uh, you don't need to know it for this class. It's just a way of writing text. Um, and it lets you put formatted text. Um, so if I wanted to put italics around US, it's a way that I could italicize US. And if I wanted to stick some bold in there, I can stick some bold in there. How do the points on the y-axis be just one-digit numbers? Well, uh, Python is, is doing this for ease of uh, display. It's Python doing that automatically. What's the 1e6? That's a Python indicating that these numbers were too big. It was a 4 million, but that was too big. So it actually shows that that's 4. And then the 1e6 is saying, hey, that's in millions. So e6 is a scientific notation. It means multiply by 10 to the sixth power. That's what a million is. You can check if you want to see this again, you can go back to the demos, click on demos on the course web page and you can see it uh, at your leisure. How did it know to add the 2014 line when I did this? Well, if we look at the table, let's go up and look at the table. I apologize for any dizziness from the scrolling. This table had a column for age. We said, put that on the x-axis. And then there was a column for 2010 and 2014. So it used all the other columns, one line per other column. There was a column for 2010 and it drew a line for that. And there was a column for 2014 and it drew a line for that. All right, that's how it knew because it was there in the table. All right, I'd like to continue on. I see there's lots of other questions. I'll stick around after class for more questions. I wanna keep going. Um, so now let's look at, uh, break this down by sex, by, by um, males versus females. And we can do that by, instead of selecting the rows where sex is zero, we select the rows where one, and that will give us the males. And the rows where sex is two will give us the females. So let's look at the um, uh, tables that you get if you do this. Um, we get a table uh, like this one. This is the population count of just the males. Here's the number of male infants. Here's the number of male one-year-olds and so on. Same for the females. Okay. So now I want to make a table where I'd like to compare the number of males of each age to females of each age. What does the, the ratio between the two look like? All right. So here's how we're going to do that. We're going to create a new table. We're going to add some columns to it. 
And one column I'm going to put in there is going to be the age. And if I stopped right here, um, I would get a, um, I would get a table that has one column, looks like this. It has a row per row of the original table with an age. See, we took the uh, column here, the age column from the males table up here. And we added that column to our new table. We started with a blank table and we added one column to it. But I want to also have, I want to have a table that has, that combines these males in the females table. See, there's the males, there's the females. You were asking before if I could put them side by side. So I'm going to put them side by side. There were 2 million, a little over 2 million infants in 2010, and a little under 2 million female infants in 2010. So I'm going to create a table for the number of males of each age. Let's do it in 2014 this time. And I can get the, that number from this column of this table. And then I'm going to take this column of the females table and stick that in there and label that females. If I do that, then um, I get a table that looks like this. The males column came from the males table, and the females column came from the females table. So this is now letting me do a side-by-side -side comparison of right here. Side-by-side -side comparison. In 2014, there were slightly more male than female infants. Um, but then as the age goes up, as we're going to see, well, what happens? Let's take a look. So we can plot this. And I plot, I make a plot, and here's what the plot looks like. Hopefully you can see this. Uh, this plot is showing by age, the total number of males of that age and the total number of females of that age. And you can see these lines look very similar. What happens is there's slightly more males at the young age. In fact, um, it appears that we don't have a complete 50-50 split for infants. Um, it's slightly more likely to be, uh, if you have a child, slightly, ever so slightly more likely to be, be get a son than a daughter, um, but very similar in proportions. And then as you get further on in age, as we look at the higher up age groups, that trend changes. And there's now, once we get up to 60-year-olds, 70-year-olds, 80-year-olds, there's more females than males. And why is that once you get to a certain age? Well, pretty much all age groups, men find more ways to die. <laughs> Life expectancy for women is longer. Uh, you know, men, men die younger for all sorts of reasons. And so you start off at these young age groups with slightly more men, but then mine are dying quicker. And when, by the time you get to a certain age, um, uh, then there's few, have fewer men of that age than there are women. Um, and uh, this difference becomes, uh, you know, fairly substantial around the 80s or 90, uh, 90s. <laughs> I jumped off a two-story roof once, someone says. All right, yes. Yeah, we have a, I do things like that. All right, so this is showing you how this kind of visualization can start to give you some information, start to extract some information from a data set. Now, maybe I'm wondering what this ratio looks like. I might wonder what's the percent of people who are female at each age group. So let's see how you could do that. Let's take, um, uh, let's figure out how we can compute that. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to add another column to this table that shows a percentage the percentage of people of that age group who are female. So I'm going to, the way I'm going to do this, I'm going to add a new column to this table. I'm going to have to compute that column. So I'm going to compute an array that holds the numbers that should go in that column. So what I want in there is I want the, out of this, I want to sum these two numbers to get the total. And then I want to know the females, what fraction are they out of that total of that age group? So uh, to get the total, I'm going to add up two numbers. So I'm going to get the arrays. So 
for the count of males, an array for the count of females. And I'm gonna add those two. And that's gonna be the total number of uh, people of that age group. And then I wanna know the percent that are female. And the percent that are female is the number that are female divided by that total. Um, and uh, that's going to give me an array. And I'm doing it as an array, so it's going to do that for every individual um, every individual row in that table. And so there's the data as an array. For infants, 48.9% of them are female and so on and so forth. But that array is a little annoying. Um, you can see it's annoying in several ways. We've got all these digits, and I kind of don't really care about the difference between 48.89% and 48.9%. So first, I'm going to round that. Um, let's look at the result of that rounding. Now I've rounded it to three, to three, uh, to three decimal places, and then I'm going to add it to the table. So, so the way we do that is. Um, Um, create a table. I'm going to take the 2014 table and then I'm going to add a column. Well, I create a new table that has a new column added on and that table, that column is this percentages. And let's look at what we have in that table. So now I've added another column here with the percentage of people of that age group who are female. And then now that I've added that column, now I can plot it. So I'd like to know for each age, how the percent who are female, what that looks like. And, oh, well, I added that to a new table and I gave it a new name. So I better use that new name. All right, so here is what that plot looks like. I put this, um, I put this, um, yeah, we plotted this on a graph. So you can see here something like uh, at age 40, roughly 50% are female. It's a roughly even split. But when you get up to much higher ages, then something like 80% are female. So if you run a nursing home, you should expect to have more females than males, maybe. So you can see the disparity becomes quite dramatic. Um, now, a note of caution. I want to give you a note of caution at this point. Um, I've done something a little bit misleading in this table, which you'll see a lot in newspapers, in propaganda, in people who are trying to convince you of something. This y-axis here is a percentage. And it's misleading because the percentage runs only from 50 to 80%. If you were just looking at this at a glance, you might assume that it goes from zero to 100%, but it doesn't. And that can make the difference look more dramatic than it actually is. So um, really what we should be doing is we should make sure when we're plotting percentages, the y-axis starts at zero and goes to 100%. So let me show you how we, could, how we can do that. This is, you don't need to know this for this class, but you don't need to know like how to do it as a plot. But I do want you to uh, see this example of how it's very easy um, to effectively lie with statistics. Here is a better, oh, that's not right. Ah, yes, there we go. Because I didn't convert to percentages, I had it as a fraction between zero and, and one. So here's a better display that puts it in perspective. While there's still a dramatic shift, it's not as dramatic as the previous plot made it look like. Okay, now let me take a look at some questions. Um, yeah, you're noticing that this is represented as a fraction, um, as a fraction out of one. Let's suppose you want it as a percentage. Well, one way to do that um, would be up here. We could say, I don't want a fraction. I want this as a percentage. So multiply by 100. All right, now you get numbers that look more like percentages. And we're happier maybe, except that now it better be 100. 
or so. Great. Why did I put the semicolon? Ignore that. Um, this, is, this is beyond what you need to know for this class. Um, this is some extra syntax we're not teaching you. Um, and the semicolon said, um, I don't want you to show me the result of the last expression in this, that last line of code, because there's no interesting result. Just, just show me the graph. You really don't need to know it. How do you add a new column or a row to an existing table? You add a new column by using dot with column. So when we had this operation up here, um, let me show you where we did that. Um, right here, dot with column. That was how we added a new column to an existing table. Why did I get the age column from the males table? Well, the age column for the males table and the females table in this instance was the same. So I could take it from either one. It doesn't matter which I took it from. I could take it from the females. That was totally arbitrary. Now, in general, you could have different values there, and then you need an operation called join that we'll teach you at some point. Um, but um, for now, it didn't matter which I used. I rounded it to three decimal places. What if I wanted to round it to like two decimal places? Then I would change that round statement to say like two. Like that. How can I extract just one value in a table? I could use the dot where operation to look for the one row that I'm interested in. All right, I want to move on. Lots of good questions here, but I want to keep going. I want to look now at a new data set of actors. Okay, so this is a list of uh, movie actors. And we have here um, different movie actors and it shows how many movies they were in. It shows their top movie, the top movie by grossing. So each movie is measured the gross amount of money that it took in. Um, at Harrison Ford, his top movie was Star Wars, The Force Awakens, um, which is what took in 936 million. Um, this is a little bit old. This data set's a few years old. Um, and for each actor, we also have the number of movies they were in. And then take, taking all the movies they were in, the total of the gross of that movie and the average. So this is not how much that actor earned. It's just the movies they were in. Okay. So tells you something about how like the, presumably the larger the gross, the bigger the hit the movie was. Um, and so um, uh, high values of this means they were tended to be in um, very, very big movies. Okay, and um, so here we've got a bunch of actors. Don't treat this as like a measure of the quality of the actor. It might be a really bit part actor that happened to be in a huge movie and then this number would be large. All right, so let's look at um, um, visualizing this data set. First place you start when you have a new data set. Let's look at maybe comparing um, uh, for each actor um, how the number of movies you're in affects the total gross of the movies that you're in. And a good way to do that is using something called a scatter plot. And here's a scatter plot. Let me talk you through this scatter plot. On the x axis, you have the number of movies. Most of these actors were in between 20 to 40 movies. And the y-axis is the total gross of all the movies that actor was in. And each point, here's the important part, each point represents a single actor, a single row in that table, okay? So for instance, here is a point, an actor who was in close to 80 movies, and the total gross of all the movies they were in was a bit over $3 billion. Who's this point? Well, if we take a look, that was uh, Harrison Ford. They were in 41 movies, total gross close to 5 billion. So there's Harrison Ford, okay? So scatterplot has one dot per individual or per row in the table. Now it kind of makes sense. You can kind of see what looks like a positive association here, which makes sense if you think about it. Scatter plots can be a helpful way to look for association. And this is positive association, kind of makes sense. The more movies you're in, the more the total grossing is because each movie you're in adds to that total. All right, but what about maybe total gross is not the right way to measure it. Maybe we should be measuring the average gross, which says something about um, the typical movie that they're in, like how big a hit it is. Okay, so we could plot that instead. The, plotting. Now here's a scatter plot. Again, each point is one actor. 
and the x-axis is the number of movies they're in, and the y-axis is the average grossing of the movie they're in. So a, so a very high average indicates an actor who is consistently in big movies. So if you're a producer, maybe this is useful to you. Um, you might say, oh, someone who's consistently in, in, in lots of big movies, either maybe they've got a good agent, they're good at picking good movies, or maybe they're very valuable, they add a lot to that movie, or maybe they're just really lucky. Here you can see kind of a negative association, which is interesting. We could maybe make up a story for why that might be. Maybe the actors who are in a lot of movies are a little less picky about which movie they're in. That says, I'm willing to be in lots of movies and there'll be smaller movies. And there's, you know, the actors over here are more pickier. They're only, you know, their agents say, no, we're only going to put you in the movie. It's going to, if we think it's going to be an absolute huge smash blockbuster hit. And, um, Another thing that's interesting to see on this graph is, yeah, someone asked me a question, who is this? This point is kind of an outlier, isn't it? It's like really far away from everyone else. So let's figure out who that is. And we can do that by taking this actor's table. And we want someone whose average per movie um, was above 400. And that gives me a new table with just one row. And that actor is Anthony Daniels. And I don't know if you know who Anthony Daniels are. Here is the test of if you are a massive, massive Star Wars fan. There's Anthony Daniels. Okay. So what's up with him? He's been in basically only the Star Wars movies. That's the only acting he's ever done. And each one of those was an enormous hit. <laughs> so that's why his average is so high. Everyone else was in... Some movies that were not such a smash and it's bringing their average down. Okay, so I showed you two kinds of plots. And um, now I wanna to talk to you a little bit about how you decide between them. Um, one kind of plot is a line plot. That was the first kind of plot we saw today. And the other kind is a scatter plot. So how do you choose between these? Well, a line plot is appropriate when you have um, the x-axis is uh, a numerical variable that has some order, so you can put them in order, and, um, and where we think that the y-axis is another numerical variable that we think maybe has some dependency on the x-axis, okay? So, um, uh, and moreover, for e and in, our, in our data set, we'll have one point per year in this case. Per, per, per value on the x-axis. Just one um, data point per year. That might be um, the total number of movies that were made that year, okay? So because the year can be put ordered, it makes sense to put it in this way. Because there's only one point per year and 20, 2008 to 2009, it kind of makes sense to join those lines. Then a line plot is appropriate. A scatter plot is appropriate when, um, again, you have two numerical variables and you're interested in the association between them. But now the situation is a little different. Now, instead of having only two things, there's actually three things. There's x-axis, y-axis, and then an individual. In this case, it was the number of movies the actor was in, the average per movie for that actor, and the name of the actor. That's kind of three things. So each dot is associated with a single actor. Then in that case, a scatter plot is more appropriate. A line plot wouldn't really make sense because there might be multiple actors who all have, who are all in the same value for the x-axis. All were in 40 movies. So you might have three points on top of each other. Then you can't really draw a line plot like that. Also, it doesn't really make sense to join adjacent lines. The line between an actor was in 40 movies and 41 movies, I don't know, you know, they might not necessarily have any connection. If you tried to draw a line, it would be some weird squiggly thing that wouldn't tell you very much. Okay, so anytime you have two numerical variables and you wanna identify whether there might be an association with them, typically you're looking for a plot can be useful and to choose between line plot or scatter plot, use this criteria. Is each plot about, plot about a single individual? Um, is there an order on the x-axis? Um, uh, do you have a single point per value of the x-axis? Does it make sense to join adjacent points? All right. 
what would happen if I tried to make a line plot for this right-hand plot? You would get weird set of lines and the lines wouldn't actually be meaningful. So a line plot would be distracting. You would have lines that would jump all the way up and down. These points would be, would be doing like this, but the up and down doesn't really convey any information. Okay. Year is a numerical variable um, because it's a number. You can be put it in an order. You can look at the difference between years. There's two years between 2010 and 2008. So that's a numerical variable. All right, um, let's continue. Um, all right, so use a line plot um, for sequential data. X-axis has an order. Um, differences in the Y values are meaningful. There's only one Y value for each X value. The common cases for when you use a line plot will be the X-axis is time, like a year, a day, um, or is, um, um, some kind of like distance, like, um, yeah, I, I, um, I took a trip and how far along that trip I was. That's kind of a proxy for time. Scatter plots for non-sequential data. There's no real sequence on the actors. There's no real ordering of the actors that's particularly important. Um, and scatter plots are particularly useful when I'm looking for an association where I think there might be some kind of a loose association. All right, categorical data, next thing I wanna talk about, how to visualize when you got some categorical data. Here is where um, uh, bar charts are useful when you have categorical data. So now um, let's look at uh, top movies of uh, 2017. Well, this is the top movies that up to 2017. And here you can see the movies where I'm rating them by the amount they grossed. So the top movie of all time by that measure is Gone with the Wind. I'm not saying it's the best movie, just the one that's brought in the most money. And Star Wars, number two. All right. Uh, now, I don't know what this adjusted is, but someone told me the adjusted gross is more appropriate. So we're gonna use the gross adjusted column for a moment. And um, let's say I only care about the top 10, then I can do that by taking the first 10 rows of this table. And there's the top 10 movies. And this is really hard to read, this dollar amount, so I can convert it to, um, um, to in millions by dividing all these numbers by a million. Yes, ah, why are these numbers so big? Ah, they're adjusted for inflation. <laughs> so the, so, so um, it wasn't that Gone with the Wind made one trillion dollars. It made a, grossed a lot of money when it was released and we're adjusting for inflation. Okay, so um, I'm making this data a little easier to understand by uh, dividing uh, each of the grosses by a million dollars and then adding this new column that is the millions. So I added this new column using the with column. I used array arithmetic to take all the values in this column, divide by a million, round to three digits, and then added that as a new column. All right, so now I wanna look at the association between the year those movie was made and how much, how much the gross was. And tempting, you might, if you draw a line plot, you get something that looks like this. And um, that's, that's too weird, that's too weird. Uh, uh, there's no real meaning to these lines. These, each dot represents a movie, it represents an individual. It doesn't represent a total of all the movies in that year or something like that. This is not something we, relationship we expect would smoothly vary from um, year to year. So a line plot here is not informative. Instead, you might do a scatter plot, or in this case, probably even more appropriate is to show a bar chart. And a bar chart shows uh, here we have categories, the title of the movie. So we've got one bar for each individual, each movie. And the length of the bar is proportional to this value that we want to look at, the adjusted gross in millions of dollars. So Gone with the Wind has the highest amount, a little over $1.8 billion in uh, adjusted for inflation um, money. And uh, that has the longest line. And so these lines now are a way to visualize the differences here rather than looking at numbers as digits. 
it's often a way to see at a glance what the relationship is. All right, so we provide you an operation to draw bar charts like this. Um, and the operation is called, well, you'd think we call it bar, but it's bar H. So that's just the name of the operation to use in our library. All right, I'm gonna stop here. So you've seen some methods for visualizing. You've seen line plots, you've seen scatter plots, which are useful for looking at relationship between two numerical variables. And you're seeing uh, bar plots, which are useful for looking at the relationship between a categorical variable and a numerical variable. Don't forget to uh, turn in um, uh, your homework too and to do the vitamin and we'll see you in lecture on Monday. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye.